We're going to talk about the reality of what it's like for people with disabilities when they navigate the web. This is something I'm extremely passionate about, and I don't, I'm not going to go into this to make you feel bad. It's more to open your minds into the daily reality for a lot of people out there and to make you aware of the positions of impact, influence, and power that you have as developers and designers of websites. So I'm Marcy Sutton. I'm the head of learning at Gatsby. Um, I bring an, a background of accessibility, and I'm a web developer. And I really love working on Gatsby's learning team because we can make best practices that include web accessibility and really push um, making great websites that work for a lot of people. And my slides are built with Gatsby and MDX deck, so a bit of using that technology to make a modern slide deck. And I can tweet out the link later. You can check out the technology on my GitHub. So accessibility. It's about making the web more inclusive to, to people with disabilities and with people with disabilities. So including people as stakeholders, hiring them on your teams, and really centering that experience so that we can make more inclusive web applications and websites. And if you're new to accessibility, you can check out Microsoft's Inclusive Design Toolkit. It has a series of personas that can teach you about how inclusive design impacts all of us. Things like being born with a disability or having a, a situational or temporary disability, such as a broken arm or having a baby in one arm or even holding a cup of coffee or tea. That can influence how somebody might interact with a computer, a mobile device, and there's really a whole spectrum of experiences that people have. I'm pretty passionate about accessibility and JavaScript applications on the web, and I recently published a front-end master's course that you can check out on this topic. I go into uh, some accessibility debugging and practices of how to test for accessibility, and then a lot of the uh, mechanics of creating accessible web applications with Gatsby and React, and really in general using JavaScript. So Gatsby, as we all are here to hear about today, is a framework for building websites and component libraries with React. And I really love this space of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, how it all comes together to create this web platform that we know and love. And Gatsby's been a great tool for doing that because we can bring those best practices and really use modern technology in ways that just feel really fun to use. There's been a project recently called the Web A Million that really gets into how websites are performing for accessibility. It's from a group called Web AIM, which stands for Web Accessibility in Mind. They ran an audit using automated testing tools of the top one million home pages on the web for accessibility. And to be honest, it's really depressing. The results are not good because we haven't been doing really much at all to improve accessibility. You know, despite my efforts as a public speaker for the past five years, um, Hashim last night or yesterday was asking me, so how's the situation for accessibility? And the crux of this talk is to just make you aware that the reality is that it's not great. But every one of you in this room is in a position to make this better. And so my hope from the end of this talk is that you are empowered with tools and ideas and techniques so that we can actually move the needle on this. Because it takes every one of us every day just chipping away at it and iterating and making it a little bit better every single day. And I still believe that we can do that, even though the landscape is a bit bleak. So I did a bit of a survey on Twitter. And I asked, for people with disabilities out there, how does it make you feel when a website is inaccessible? That visceral experience of when someone is navigating an online service to pay their bills or to do some online grocery shopping or even just consume entertainment, video and audio and so on. And the results were a little sad. I heard things like, it depends on the website, but I'd say mostly I feel frustration followed by some anger if it's actually important to me. I get frustrated, but then I kind of force myself to move on. The thing that bothers me the most is when sites have really small fonts or bad color contrast. And color contrast in automated testing of the top 500,000 websites, color contrast is far and away the most common accessibility problem. 
where your foreground and background colors don't have enough of a range of difference so that it's really subtle and hard to read, hard to view. Here's another quote. I will leave the site, but in case of banking websites, I have no option but to look for help, and it makes me feel dependent. <laughs> so for somebody who needs to go to an ATM in you know, the physical offline world, it's a good analog to someone using a web application to do their banking. If you have to share your PIN or your account details with someone, that's a risk as a person with a disability that you could be defrauded, and there have been legal cases around this. So the technology could be better to really make these websites safer to use. Here's another one. Sites with animations make me dizzy, so I just close them ASAP. And there's a lot of animations out there. Um, we do have tools that we can use, like prefers reduce motion, to turn animations off from the operating system level. So we want to be sparing it with how we apply delight, uh, because it can actually cause harm, and that's not very delightful. I feel a twist in the gut. I feel like an edge case no one else cares about. A low priority ticket in a dusty corner. So people are not edge cases. People are, they're people, and they might not have as common of a use case, um, but fortunately with accessibility, there are some common techniques and uh, approaches to making websites that we can employ to make them more accessible so that people aren't feeling this way. Because otherwise, people feel excluded and invisible. And I don't know about you, but if it's, if it's you being excluded and feeling invisible, that's not a great way to navigate the web. So I want you to acknowledge this pain. I know this is something that people often say, well, we don't have time for that, or we don't have budget for that, or it's not our users. I just want to take a moment to sit with that discomfort and acknowledge that this is something that people with disabilities experience on a regular basis. And it's something that we can all control. That's the best thing about it, is that just by acknowledging this, that's the first step to actually doing something about it. Because there's so many types of people out there in the world. And that's the beauty of the web, is that we can reach millions of people with the websites that we're creating. So it's really about recognizing the opportunities that we have to actually make this better. So UI components. We're building websites for people, for the most part. Uh, and if we're building user interfaces, that we could think of them as components um, that split your UI into independent and reusable pieces and think about each piece in isolation. That's taken directly from the React documentation. They have some great accessibility docs as well. But if I think of this in terms of systems and how we bake problems into our components, I think of it as baking in assumptions about design and development, often embedding those barriers to access at a systemic level. So that if you're using a component library and you're baking in assumptions about design and you know, poor contrast, eh, nobody worries about that, you're embedding that into your component library that then could be applied across websites, across web properties. So those problems, they then are applied across websites and across systems. So at least you know we could we could laugh about this a little bit, and I don't know if people are as familiar over here uh, with garbage pail or garbage pail kids, but I've done a parody of that with garbage pail components, um, just to like lean into this pain because it was sort of a, a cult uh, series of these trading cards and things that I thought, wow, well if we could just like dial up the pain and really acknowledge it, I'm, that's the parody that I'm going to make. So I've made a series of components that can be a parallel to how this experience feels for someone with a disability, but apply it to the more able-bodied people. So I have a component here that's like a, a little profile um, drop-down that you might click on. And if I try to use my mouse, it's really hard to get to. Like if I hover on it, maybe I can get to this component and it's really hard to click on. There we go, I finally got it. So sometimes you, know, you might have a, a component like this that seems really usable, um, but if, if, if we had equal opportunity and accessibility, everyone would be equally frustrated, and that's what this component feels like to me. Here's another example. If I turn off the mouse cursor for everyone, it gets a little bit frustrating. And if I hover just so slightly, 
maybe I can actually get to this modal. I've actually made it a little too hard for myself because I can't even find it. <laughs> That's how it feels when you can't reach something, huh? How does that feel for you? Couldn't even get to that one. So here's another one. If I had a modal window, uh, such as the one that I couldn't actually open just now, think of that if I were a keyboard user and I couldn't get to that button, that's what that would feel like. Um, so usually when you have a modal window, it's a layer that opens over your screen, uh, something like this screen curtain. Uh, but if we don't properly disable the background, if there's links and form inputs and components back there, um, you can be back in that back layer and never able to get to the modal window. So I've created this screen curtain, um, and if I tab to these controls, that's what we call these interactive things in the background, this is simulating as if I had a modal window that I hadn't disabled the background. And just to make this even more annoying, I can't even turn this off now, so that's fun. Just have to keep going. So we have our next series of garbage pail components here with trapping TAM um, because a keyboard trap is another really common problem. And this one's pretty pervasive and you really can't get out of it. So I have a little autocomplete widget here that if I uh, use my keyboard and maybe I start typing, um, this is my dog's name, Rainier McCheddarton. But I'm trapped in here now. I'm hitting my key, my tab key, and I can't get out of here. I could maybe use my mouse but if I hit my keyboard and I start typing, I'm stuck. I can't get out of here. And it's really sad how commonly this happens. And actually, I borrowed this from a real web application. So I didn't even make this up. This is a real thing. And here's an example of it in use um, on a web application that I'm calling dog training, which could be a platform for guide dog handlers, perhaps. But if I hit tab here, I'm stuck. And in the context of this broader web application, this makes the rest of it completely unusable. So in isolation, this component is unusable, but it's even worse when it's in context with everything else in this web application. I just can't even get past this. Maybe if I tab or use my mouse to skip by it, it really doesn't make a difference. And so it's really important that we test our web components on their own, but also in the broader context of a web app so that we know that, and, and use your keyboard more importantly. When you're creating these components, test with your keyboard so that you're not causing these traps. Because if, if it bugs you in development, you'll be po possibly more motivated to fix it. Um, but that's really a, just a, an early look at what your users might be feeling. And that frustration that you're putting out there without even realizing it because you never tested with your keyboard. All right, carousels. Who's built a carousel? Anyone? A lot of carousels. These are great for stakeholders who want to have equal importance on multiple pieces of content. And the, the garbage pail kid here with Carousel Cameron and the horse being impaled is just that visceral pain of like how auto-rotating carousels can feel. You know, just really let that sink in. It's raunchy and rough. So I have an image gallery here um, that I took from W3 Schools. I didn't really even change it. Um, and so if I try to use my keyboard on this one, I have a very strange focus outline that doesn't really do anything with this, um, this carousel. But if I can use my mouse, like some users can, the majority of users, I can still navigate through this image gallery. And at first glance, if you can see the screen and you can use a mouse, there's really not much wrong with it. Um, if it were auto-rotating, you might have issues with motion for making people dizzy. Um, but really to show you the pain of this carousel, and I do have some text down below, um, I'm gonna turn on voiceover, which is the screen reader on a Mac. I'm gonna use the um, function command F5 keys to turn this on. In slides, Google Chrome window has keyboard focus. You are currently on a group. Okay, I'm gonna navigate through this carousel and let's see what's happening under the hood. A large black bear inspecting a dumpster, a dump truck full of cut wood, group, main. You are currently on a group. To enter a large black bear inspecting a dumpster, a dump truck full of cut wood, a dumpster overflowing with garbage, Photoshop into a field with flowers, a dumpster overflowing with garbage, Photoshop into a field with flowers, a dumpster overflowing with garbage, Photoshop into a field with flowers, group. You, you are, are currently, currently on a group. group. To, to interact, interact with- A little bit odd. 
A large black, black air inspecting, inspecting a dumpster, a dump, a dump truck full of cut wood, a dumpster overflowing with garbage, photoshopped into a field with flowers, a dumpster overflowing with garbage, photoshopped into a field with flowers, a dumpster overflowing with garbage, photoshopped into a field with flowers, a person with gum stuck to their boot, a person, a large black bear inspecting a dumpster, a dump truck full of cut wood, a dumpster overflowing with garbage, photoshopped into a field with flowers, a dumpster overflowing with garbage, photoshopped into a field with flowers, a dumpster overflowing with garbage, photoshopped into a field with flowers, a person with gum stuck to their boot, 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 reusable water bottles, 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 F5 button. You are currently on a button. To press this button, F5 button, F5, F5 button. Let's turn voiceover off. Voice over off. There we go. Okay. <laughs> so carousels. They look fine, but if you peek under the hood of how they, these images are labeled, I've actually created, it's not quite a factorial carousel because I didn't use multiplication, but it's an additive carousel where every label for every image is repeated. So to get to the, the label for that fifth image, we had to hear the additive labels of every image before it. And I am serious, I did not make this up. This was a real component that somebody made and it went to production and they had no idea that it had this level of accessibility problems. Because if you're sighted and you're not testing for accessibility, and even if you're using automated testing tools, those images had alt text on them. So that wouldn't actually be flagged by most testing tools. I've worked on accessibility testing tools and maybe I could write a rule for that, but not extremely common, but the importance here is that we have to test the things that we're making. Make sure that you're firing up a screen reader every now and then to like make sure that you're not having these, this level of problems. Because I mean, it's funny in a way, but if you were actually trying to navigate a web page that had this pervasive of problems, you would definitely leave the site. I mean, those quotes we had earlier of people going, ah, I get frustrated and give up. This is why. Um, and to make matters worse, um, the carousel when I navigate, uh, if I've scrolled down the page, and if it were auto-rotating, this would be really painful, it's actually focusing the first slide every time you go through, which is something I have done before. Uh, thought I was helping accessibility, really wasn't. Um, so, you know, we don't, we aren't all born knowing how accessibility works, and we certainly make mistakes along the way. Hopefully nothing is, horrendous as this one, um, but these are common problems that we want to make sure that we're keeping accessibility in mind as we're developing. We can do this by not assuming that users have perfect vision. Absolutely, people have different ways of navigating, including how they see. It's not okay to require a mouse. We don't want to assume that. And actually, if you uh, have repetitive use injuries, you need to use a keyboard because you're, you have arm strain from using a mouse, you'll start to feel this for yourself um, if you don't already re rely on the keyboard, which is super common. We can't assume that motion won't cause harm, that it's delightful for everyone, so we want to turn things off. Uh, we can't assume that everyone knows what icons mean. And Google applications have this problem frequently where they use icons, and a lot of web applications do, where the icons don't actually have any text under them, so it's a guessing game what the icons are for. We can't assume that content uh, doesn't need alternatives, so things like video and audio, having alternative text and captions, that's why our, our live transcription is so great, because people consume this information in different ways. And finally, we can't assume that people fit neatly into boxes. People have multiple disabilities and different ways of navigating, um, and we have to let go of some of that per pixel perfection and experience perfection because we can't really control how our users are navigating. So some ways of thinking about accessibility is in terms of how people interact with it. How, what types of disabilities do people have? People have vision disabilities from birth, degenerative vision loss, color, uh, contrast issues. Uh, people have mobility limitations, not being able to use a mouse. Um, cognitive disabilities, things like traumatic brain injury, seizures, um, learning disabilities, autism. Hearing disabilities, being deaf or hard of hearing, um, either born with it or degenerative hearing loss. 
and speech disabilities. Like if someone can't actually interact with a web application that is re relying on conversational user interfaces, we need alternatives, different ways to navigate or someone just won't be able to use that application. So here's how this gets baked into the user interface components that we might create. Turning off focus styles, that's a huge one. Um, and Kyle mentioned in his keynote that I've done some user testing for accessibility in Gatsby and JavaScript frameworks. Um, and I found through user testing that focus styles that are visible are amazing for a lot of different people. Yet commonly we turn them off because the, uh, the superiority of mouse users is always put first. Um, but if you can't use a mouse and you're relying on the keyboard, those focus styles are essential. And really that generally a lack of keyboard access, that can impact so many people. Um, and it really makes a better web application, I think, if you can use a keyboard to navigate it. Things like poor contrast and font size, which we heard in one of our quotes earlier, the inability to zoom or magnify the screen, that's amazing if you really need to look more carefully or you're, you're a low vision user. Not supporting screen readers at all, and this piggybacks on keyboard support, and those things really do go well together. Auto-playing motion, you know, the auto-rotating carousels or um, auto-playing video, delightful animations that really make people sick under some certain circumstances. Cryptic and unlabeled icons, um, either with no alt text for them or no text labeling under it if people don't know what that icon means and then a, a lack of captions or alternative descriptions if we have media content. Now if you're familiar or unfamiliar with some of these practices, um, and of course we all have to start somewhere and that's absolutely okay, I would recommend checking out the ARIA authoring practices guide, um, which is from the Accessible Rich Internet Applications group. Um, it's a great starting point for learning about accessible interactions and semantics, so you can learn about things like modals and some of the components that I showed that were really painful. I, I'm showing like the pain so we can get familiar with that, but to move on from there, we need to know how to do it better. And the ARIA Authoring Practices Guide, like I wouldn't ship those components exactly to production as they are, but they're a great starting point to learn about some of the common patterns. And so you can find that on GitHub. We also have some docs on the Gatsby site for making your Gatsby site accessible. And some of this knowledge could be applied to any website. Because a lot of these issues are common in web applications, including Gatsby sites, um, but they're really not unique to Gatsby. This is a, a common web need. And so you can find the doc on making your site accessible. It gives you some tips on how to test, how to use um, tools, and how to make a more accessible Gatsby site. I would really recommend working with people with disabilities, and this is what we did at Gatsby to learn more about how to make routing more accessible. Um, I worked with Fable, which is a group out of Toronto, Canada. There's another group called Access Works from Nobility, and these are groups that you can engage in your development process to actually test a prototype or a component or a web application, because we don't all know, I mean, a lot of us don't have disabilities, so how can you bridge that gap of experience to know whether something actually works. I would recommend doing this after you've covered the basics. Um, so going through some of the common issues that I mentioned, um, and I, I have some resources at the end, but once you've done that groundwork of the, the low hanging fruit of accessibility challenges, engaging with people with disabilities can really take it to that next level. And I went into this process with quite a bit of experience and it challenged even my own assumptions and my own biases, because we all have them. That's just part of being human. And if you want to learn more about the user testing that I did with Gatsby um, and Fable, coming up on October 10th, there is the Inclusive Design 24 conference. It is a virtual, free, 24-hour conference on accessibility. So no matter where you are in the world, whether you're busy that day and you need to tune in later, um, it will all be live streamed and recorded and there's a huge wealth of knowledge being shared that day. And there's past archives as well. Um, so my talk will be on the user testing that we did for Gatsby. So for more accessibility information, because um, I threw a lot of pain at you, but I wanna set you up for success so that you know where to go from, from here. I have a page on my site, which is a Gatsby site. It's marcysutton.com slash web-accessibility-resources. 
And I have a series of books and tools, and I have a bunch of articles on my site so that you can learn about you know, how to make your links and buttons more accessible or um, where to look for more information to get started. And just this week, there was a, a resource published from WebAIM again. They were the ones that did the WebAIM Million. They have a project called the Screen Reader Survey, which for privacy reasons, we don't have analytics for a lot of accessibility things. People with disabilities don't really want to be tracked because there's a pretty terrible legacy of that. So to counter that, to give us some data that we can work with of which browsers are being used, which screen readers, the Screen Reader Survey version 8 has come out, and I just read it this morning. Um, it's giving us some really good details about which screen readers and browsers to prioritize and how people with disabilities are interacting and reporting on their usage versus those of us who are practitioners and more able-bodied people. So I'd highly recommend that. So thank you so much for having me. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Marcy Sutton and GitHub and Instagram, all the things. Uh, if you have questions about accessibility, come find me in the breaks. Uh, if you have questions, you can ask on Twitter as well. Um, so enjoy the rest of the time and thanks for having me.